Turning Point is brought to you by PC Wealth Management of Morgan Stanley Smith Barney and the law firm of Duffy & Duffy, protecting the victims of medical error. Welcome. Our very special guest today is Mr. Corey Rooney. Corey Rooney is a producer extraordinaire, and I have to believe you've you've sold over 100 million records that you've produced. Yeah, pretty much. That's about close to the number. I think 36 million of those are J Lo alone, right? Yes, Jennifer Lopez. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. It would almost be easier to name who you haven't worked with than who you've worked with. But I'll, I'll name a couple and correct me if I'm right or wrong. Right. Jennifer Lopez. Definitely. Mark Anthony. Yeah. Uh, Mary J. Blige. Yes. 50 Cent. Yes. Uh, Mariah Carey we got. Yes. And uh, actually you were very close to her, her ex-husband. Yes. And that's Tommy Mottola. Mm -hmm. uh, still close to him? Yes. Yeah. Tommy is somebody who's, you know, like... <clears throat> it's it's funny, my years of working at Sony, a lot of people used to scratch their head and try and say, like, how how did you get so close to this guy? Like, we've been here 10 years prior, you know? Uh, and I don't know, I guess I'm the one guy that was kind of the executive slash music guy that Tommy could really relate to and talk to, you know? I mean, uh, he would come to the studio with me after, after work hours, we'd go to the studio, and, you know, he got a chance to really express himself and, you know, some of the ideas and things that he had musically, even though he was the, the you know, the chief um, executive, he can he can kind of express himself musically, and I would get it and bring it bring it to form, you know. Business wise, was he a mentor to you? Uh, yeah, yeah, he was. How about musically? Who was your musical mentors? <sighs> you know, I had a lot of musical mentors. I mean, it started in my household. My house, my parents had a lot of hit records in the '60s. The Exciters. The Exciters. Well, my parent, my my dad was the male in the group. My mom was Brenda Reed. Is Brenda Reed the lead singer of the Exciters? Tell them was a big hit. Tell them was a big hit. And um, they toured with the Beatles in their first American tour. And, uh, you know, so in my household, it was always, you know, music, music, music. I had people like the Isley Brothers in my house. My dad produced It's Your Thing with the Isley Brothers. And he actually is the piano player on It's Your Thing. You know, so like for me, I would rush home from school because I couldn't wait to see, you know, all the cars parked in front of the house and, you know, who's in the house rehearsing. That's, so that's really where it started for me. When was your first song written? How old were you? My first song I was, uh, that I ever wrote, I co-wrote with my sister, um, who passed away. But um, it was a song called All of the Above Except for Love. And she woke me up. I was probably 11. And, you know, because I was playing the piano. And she said, I wrote a song, and I need you to help me put music to it. So we run downstairs, and we make it. And at first, we, she started approaching it like she was making a joke. But then everyone else that heard it, my dad and everybody said, look, this is far from a joke. This is pretty good. And, you know, at that point, you know, they had us in the studio and, and they really started to put a lot of focus on, um, you know, us making music. But her especially, she was the one in my household that I thought was going to be, you know, huge. That's a, a big know. category to be in, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah. After this, we're going to take a quick break and we'll okay. come back with Corey Rooney. I told my mom, I want to be an engineer. You know, she thought that I meant a recording engineer. So she started dragging me to the studio also, like, hey, you know what, if that's what you want, I'm gonna have them teach you. And just... So like, I'm sitting there and I never want to hurt my mother's feelings and say, no, not this engineer. The Turning Point is brought to you by Smith DeGroat Real Estate, serving the tri-state area since 1955, and CAI, insurance solutions since 1961. We're back, Corey Rooney, producer extraordinaire is our and songwriter extraordinaire. I mean, it's uh, you, you earn those titles when you have those kind of numbers. I mean, it's tremendous numbers. Uh, we were talking earlier about your first song written. You recorded the first song you wrote? Uh, yeah, we did. It was a song called All of the Above Except for Love. And my parents took us in the studio. Um, 
you know, it was it happened so fast for me. I just all I knew is like I we structured this song, my sister and I, and we went into this, you know, we went to meet a guy in Manhattan. I don't remember I know his name was Baba. I don't know what his his full name was. I know he was a producer. When you have a name like Baba, you don't need a full right. name. <laughs> right. I know his name was Baba. And I know there was a gentleman uh, named John Bishop involved. And I, I don't even know where any of these people are right now. But I do remember, and I was probably like 11 years old. And um, I mean, within 24 hours, we were in the studio, we cut the song, and that song, like, I don't know, like people were calling from California, from, you know, wanting to fly us out and talk to us. And it was really her featured as a vocalist, but both of us wrote the song, you know, together. You got the bug there, or it took a little later to get? Well, I'll tell you, a funny, a funny story was before my sister dragged me in the studio with that. Well, I mean, got me and woke me up. I really didn't have the bug. And I didn't think I got the bug until I was like in my teens. Um, my mother asked me one day what I wanted to do when I grew up. And the crazy thing is, you know, they were doing construction on my block when I was a kid. And they had the whole block like torn up to the point where you can see the pipes down, you know, down in the, in the ground. They yeah. tore up the whole street. And I asked the guy, like one guy who had his like, you know, clipboard and everything, what he did for a living. And he said, I'm an engineer. So I said, wow, well, that's what I want to do. I want to be an engineer. And I told my mom, I want to be an engineer. You know, she thought that I meant a recording engineer. So she started dragging me to the studio also, like, hey, you know, well, if that's what you want, I'm going to have them teach you. And so like, I'm sitting there and I never want to hurt my mother's feelings and say, no, not this engineer. You know, so I was just in the studio and it was interesting and it was always what I had, you know, in me, but it just wasn't, I mean, I, to this day, I, I, I enjoy building houses and, and I wanted to be an architect. Do you have a method, a, a strict method or are you kind of vary it? Uh, as far as your songwriting goes, do you start out with something? Or you, you know, uh, it sometimes it just hits you. Whatever hits you first, you, you kind of work with it, you know? You're 15 years old, right? Your mother's taking it all, all these studios and checking it out. What happens next in your career that kind of gets you going? Um, my family had gone through a lot. Parents split up. Um, you know, just a lot How old of, were you when that happened? I was 17 going on 18. You know, um, and like I said, it was adversity. So at that point, I went from, you know, working in an airport and just really trying to make any kind of money I could make to try and help out and, and kind of get me and my mom on, you know, like in a stable place. And then I used to sit and think, and I said, man, I gotta try and utilize my, my God-given gift, you know, to see if that could push me ahead because this airport gig is not really gonna push me ahead. Um, and my mother met, uh, met the mother of, um, my mom met the mother of a guy that was in a group called the Fat Boys, a rap group, popular rap group at the yeah, time. Yeah, sure. And uh, so she comes home one day, you know, because we were living with my uncle, and she wakes me up, and she says, you know, hey, look, I met one of the guys from the Fat Boys. I was at his mom's, you know, the house tonight, and I got an autograph for you. You know, I'm like, I don't care about the autograph. Right. You know, not that I'm some, you know, I just, it just didn't impress me. But she said, I want to bring you over there so you can meet him. And, uh, you know, when I first met him, I was standoffish. He was really arrogant, you know to everyone around him. He was like obnoxious, as a matter of fact, to everyone around. Is he still obnoxious to you? No, as a matter of fact, he became one of my, he became my best friend at that point. You know, he, for some reason, you know, he respected me and, well, what it was, was he heard a demo that I'd done with, at a friend's little studio. And he took that demo, he heard it, like two minutes of it, and took it out of the tape deck, and he said, you mind if I make a copy of this? And he made a copy, and pulled off in his car, and every like time I would run into him in the street, he'd be laughing, go, look, look what I'm listening to, and he's blasting my, my record, you know? So, I mean, he, he respected me through my music, and then we hung out one night, and we realized that we had a lot in common, so we kind of put our heads together, we put everything we had together. I actually literally moved in his house with him, and I quit my job at the airport, and, you know, he had the relationships at the record companies, and I had the ability to get on the phone and set up the meetings and speak, you know? So I used him as my calling card. Like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm calling for so-and-so-and-so, we'd like to set up a meeting. And it just really started to come together really fast.
when we come back with Corey Rooney, we'll talk about his first record deal. We'll be back. Diddy was the intern, believe it or not. Did he intern for you? What? All of us. He, yeah. he was kind of like the guy. I mean, he wasn't Corey Rooney's intern. Right, right. But he was the intern for Uptown Records at the time. And, you know, he was the guy who would be the guy running to get McDonald's and, you know, stuff like that if you needed that. Turning Point with Frank McKay is brought to you by Atlantic Honda, New York's auto giant, and Herman Katz, Can Jimmy and Klein, property tax attorneys and advisors. Welcome back. We're with songwriter, record producer, Corey Rooney. Before the break, we were going to get into your first record deal. You remember your first record deal? Yeah. The first record was the Fat Boys. And while we were in the middle of doing that, we started working with a, a company called Uptown Records, which was where Heavy D, um, I'll Be Sure, you know, Teddy Riley, all of these guys. Dougie Fresh. No. Dougie Fresh. Everybody was there. Um, and Andre Harrell was the guy. That was also where Diddy came from. Diddy was the intern, believe it or not. Um, was he your, did he intern for you? What? All of us. He, yeah. he was kind of like the guy. I mean, he wasn't Corey Rooney's intern. Right, right. But he was the intern for Uptown Records at the time. And, you know, he was the guy who would be the guy running to get McDonald's and, you know, stuff like that if you needed that. Um, try that now. Yeah, try, try that now. <laughs> yeah, right. Try getting him to run to get McDonald's, McDonald's yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, and we used to give him such a hard time. It was funny. I mean, because he's about two years younger than I am. And we would go and, like, harass him all the time. And... One day he, you know, I gotta give it to him. He's this guy's always been like the ballsiest guy in the world, you know. And we used to um, run into him at the office and you know mess around with him, you know, steal stuff from him, you know, because he always always managed to have cool records, so we'd steal it from him. Um, and then one day, you know, he sat with Andre Harrell and he said, you know, like I, I want the A and R spot, and Andre gave him the shot, you know. And Mary um, J. Blige. Yeah, right. well, it, and so the first project, well, the first project was a project called Father MC, you know, and while we were in the middle of that, you know, that was when Puff was making his transition. And at the tail end of that album, when we finished, Puff had been made the A&R guy, and we went from, like, teasing this guy to now he actually has a right to come to the studio and kind of critique. And that wasn't really, nobody, none of the producers was happy with that at the time because they just really wasn't looking at him as the, as the type of guy that had the, you know, the right to come and critique something. But he taught me a major lesson because, okay, we worked on an album called Mary, uh, what's the 411 with Mary J. Blige. It was our first album, right? And there were songs on that album, especially Real Love, which, you know, arguably is her biggest record, you know, in her career. Um, yep. Right. Um, and I'm going to tell you something. I fought like crazy against certain things that the record, like I used a sample in that record, a, a drum sample. And I didn't want, from a rap group, um, Milk, like Milk and Giz, the, the rap group used this thing. And um, I didn't want to give them 20% or 27%, you know, because I used their sample. I didn't want to give up the publishing. Is, is that how much you have to give for something like that? That's not, that's not a stand. That's how much they were generous enough to oh, take. Right, they I had the you. right to take 100%. Right. Because that's the way the law works. If you sample someone's record, they have a right to take 100%. That's interesting. You know? But they were generous. And I was like, oh, I'm not giving them that much money. You know, we could just redo the drums. And Puff fought me. 19-year-old Puff fought me, fought me, fought me. I, I claimed that he didn't know what he was talking about. He wasn't musically inclined. He didn't know. But he fought me, fought me, fought me. And my partner, Mark Morales, actually agreed with him. So I lost the argument. I learned the lesson. The lesson was that he, at that point, had the ears of the consumer. I realized that the very person that I'm making a record for and the person I'm trying to please was him. OK? I'm arguing with the consumer, you know? And once I lost that argument to him, it taught me a big lesson. Let's talk about the people that you saw from the start of their careers, the very beginning of their careers. Mm -hmm. You see a common thread, a trait that they might have that does it for them, or you see them as all different? Is it They're right? all different. Mary J. Blige, who we worked with from the very beginning, I did not think, because of everything that she was going through in her personal life, 
I didn't think she would be here right now. And I'm not talking about in a physical way. I'm talking about I just didn't think she was going to hold it together to have such a long, successful career. You know, and I mean, to my surprise, not only is she here, but she's at this point an iconic, like she's a legend. She's, she's here. Thriving. Yeah. She's yeah. You know, and she's, she's always going to be here. You know, I, I, I really didn't see that coming. You know, uh, Jennifer Lopez, I knew was a star. I mean, granted, she had movies. And when I walked in, it wasn't that I walked into, you know, this voice that sounded like Gladys Knight or anything like that, but I walked into someone who was a superstar, you know, who got it, who understood. When we went in the studio, she just got it. She knew how to make a record work, you know? And I knew that she was going to be probably one of the best salespersons of behind any record I can give her, you know? I knew she was going to go out there and sell it. On that note, we'll be back right after this with Corey Rooney. If you got a paintbrush in your hand, the producer's the guy with the paintbrush. You know, there's a canvas, okay, I'm the producer and I got the brush. So I'm going to put red where it belongs, I'm going to put the white where it belongs, and I'm going to do all this. Turning Point is brought to you by PC Wealth Management of Morgan Stanley Smith Barney and the law firm of Duffy & Duffy, protecting the victims of medical error. What must a producer do? Bottom line. Well, the producer has to see the big picture. You know, the, the producer is the one in the room, you know, or in the, in the scope of the whole project to, to see where all of the pieces fit. Like if you got a paintbrush in your hand, the producer is the guy with the paintbrush. You know, there's a canvas, okay, I'm the producer and I got the brush. So I'm going to put red where it belongs, I'm going to put the white where it belongs, and I'm going to do all this. So if I'm the producer and I'm working with a Jennifer Lopez, I know that I need to take this music over here and apply it to this voice and this beat is not going to work for her because she needs something more hard hitting. You just really have to know how to put all of the pieces together, you know? What must an artist do to succeed? First of all, an artist has to be willing to open his or her eyes to understanding what the right vehicle is, you know, because some artists especially today because the publishing business is uh, still a major part of the music business where people are making money. So a lot of artists are insisting on like, oh, well, I, I need to write on all of my records. If you're not a great songwriter, then why are you pushing writing when you're going to put yourself in jeopardy of not having a hit record? Right. You, un you understand? Yeah. I, that's the number one foolish, most foolish thing an artist could do. In your career, or if you prefer, in your life, what was your turning point? My, my turning point was when I made my deal with Sony Music. All the way across the board, it changed my life. First of all, the Sony system gave me a better sense of how I should be handling my business, you know? Because before that, it was just kind of, um, it was more independent, and there were so many rooms to make mistakes. And in the Sony system, first and foremost, every, every I, was, was dotted and every T was crossed. And it made me want to step up, you know, as, as a businessman and be more organized and understand things better. Uh, but it was also a turning point because um, the Sony system gave us big opportunities to be on big records and, you know, things like working with Mariah Carey. Um, working with Mariah and Tommy, it made me see things, you know, from a, 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 a big, broad scope, you know? When you get a chance to go and see the build up to like, okay, you're working on an album like the Music Box album, and you know, to the point where they release it and it sells 22 million records worldwide, you know, and there's Grammy nominations and everything like that. I mean, that was, you know, in, in a year's time, I mean, we went from ground zero all the way to like, you know, to the epitome of, you know, someone's dream, you know? I saw it all in that one timeline, you know? What do you do now? I mean, you sold, we estimated over 100 million records. You have no idea you've won Grammys. Right. You've worked with every major star. What do you do from here? <clears throat> well, you know, right now I'm, I'm excited about the fact that, you know, a lot of people have kind of um, claimed that the internet was a really bad thing, you know? Years ago, there were executives that were like saying, oh, the internet, it's the devil, it's gonna destroy us all. I think it's an incredible way of being able to, to, to 
not only distribute music, but to also exploit and springboard things. And so what I do now is look for opportunities to be able to build brands. Because the branding opportunities now, I mean, years ago, the closest you had to an, a branding opportunity was, you know, for Pepsi to come along, you know, and, and hope that, you know, you, you're going to do a deal where you're going to be endorsed by Pepsi and blah, blah, blah. But now you have opportunities where you got people who, you know, like Diddy with Ciroc, you know, he's got his own brand. You know, he's, he doesn't have to be hired by a liquor company, you know, like to, you know, to be like the Marlboro Man or something like that. That's his brand. He's pushing his brand. Uh, he's using all of those vehicles that we have, whether it be internet, whether it be videos, television, whatever it is, to push his brand, you know? And that's what I'm hoping right now. I'm hoping to build opportunities where I can create brands. An artist like Lady Gaga is a brand. She's a walking, breathing brand, you know? Like a, she's a monster machine. I mean, the, 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 the revenue opportunities with her is, like, is endless. And I am excited about that. You know, when I was with the Sony years, Jennifer Lopez, uh, you know, though I was executive producer and producer and writer of her projects, she was not my artist to brand like that, okay? So now I'm looking forward to building the next JLo's of the future so that I can share in those opportunities to brand. And that's why I'm into the reality TV show thing as well, because again, you know, you look at TV shows and you can say, man, these Jersey Shore kids, they're all, they, they all have perfume lines and liquor lines and clothing lines. Look, man, now's the time to really, really go crazy, you know? So Sounds you know. right on. Yeah. Listen, hey, thanks for being here. You're the best. Man. Corey Rooney, everyone. Producer Corey Rooney. Be with us next time on Turning Point.